Let's take a look at our Bibles to Judges 16. We're going to look at the last part of Samson's life. Uh, he, uh, it doesn't appear he lived a long time. Uh, he, he had a way of hurrying it along, you know. And uh, there, last week we finished up with the fact that uh, he uh, met Delilah and then he kept playing with her, and she wanted to really, she had a motive of getting him destroyed. Uh, she may have loved him, but she loved her people more than she loved him. So uh, I don't know that she loved him at all. I think she just saw an opportunity. Remember, uh, they came to her and said, if you'll, if you'll give us uh, Samson and get him to uh, you know, find out where his strength lies, We'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So had a bounty on his head. She looked at that gift card and said, you know, I'd rather have that. And this old boy, these guys are a dime a dozen. <laughs> Not so with Samson. He was unique. Was he? And, of course, he had done all kind of feats. God had strengthened him, come, blessed him, and allowed him to uh, do many things to help deliver uh, the children of Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, those Philistines were thorns in the flesh. It's like they never went away. They kept hassling and being a problem and they at times ruled over them. And in this case in Samuel's era they were ruling over them and uh, for 40 years. Along came Samson and God used him to be a deliverer and yet he never really broke loose from the influence of the Philistines. Now, the Philistines are a type of the world uh, and uh, in all of its, uh, in its religion, the world's religion. Uh, they were very religious people. They just served a false god, Dagon. Uh, to this day, that name is still out there. Some of your uh, late Hollywood uh, movies about these superheroes uh, have used the name Dagon in their movie productions and their acting roles. Uh, they have characters in some of these Avenger series that uh, depict Dagon. And then there are rock and roll groups that have taken on the name of, uh, of the life of Dagon. And then uh, I saw today where uh, somebody, uh, the, the Satan of Temple, decided to, the Satanist decided to build a new temple and name it after the mother of Samuel Alito, the Supreme Court judge. And, uh, you know, here's the thing. You know, you hear about Satanists and how they do uh, the devil would have us think that that's where he's operating. <laughs> Listen, he's more subtle than that. Uh, these, are, these are just foolish, uh, God-denying people whose their foolishness has come to the top of the surface of their life. Uh, the devil, he, he uses false religion and spiritual lies and more than he does some kind of temple that a bunch of folks, I saw where they had the statue of a man with a goat face and... <laughs> You know, I'm thinking, oh, come on, you know. But people go for that, you know. And we'll all in church go, oh, when we don't do that when they're teaching false doctrine, telling people they got to they gotta work their way to heaven, we don't go, oh, you know. But we go to a goat being made by some man. Uh, it happens. Well, so Samson kept fooling around with these Philistines and eventually there in verse 18 of chapter number 16 and when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart uh, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines the lords of the Philistines every time you see Philistines in the Bible you keep reading and you'll find the lords of the Philistines they're everywhere I suppose that's their politicians but, uh, but, I mean, you can go to Exodus, you can go to Judges, you can go to 1 Samuel, and you'll always run into not only the Philistines, but the lords of the Philistines. So these guys must have thought they were pretty important. 
And so they got this woman to deceive this man, and he didn't fall for it for a while, but he lost all senses because he kept playing with it, and she kept telling him, the, the, the Philistines be upon you. Now, a normal guy would have got up and ran, but this guy couldn't get past her beauty, I guess. But then again, he's played around with these people, and he's violated God's will for his life, and maybe he gets where he can't think anymore. And I suspect a lot of Christians are out here right now that got away from the Lord and got out of fellowship with Him, and, and, and they, that's why they can't think. You, you run into them on these moral issues, and they'll say, well, you know, where are you, where have you, where are you coming from? The Bible's clear on this issue. And they'll go, well, you know, that, they get to where they can't think anymore. That's from being away from the place God wants them to be. And they get to where they actually begin to acquiesce and join, in many cases, uh, the modern Philistine world and their philosophies and ideas. And they'll be apologists for them. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, they get uh, shipwrecked, no doubt. Well, she, uh, she said there in verse number 19, she made him to sleep upon her knees. That's a bad place for a man of God to be, on the knees of a wicked Philistine woman. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Now, did you get that? She started beating up on him. Never really thought much about that. She began to afflict him before the guys got there and started beating him up. And normally this wouldn't have happened. Of course, he, he could have whipped all 500 of them if they were there. It didn't matter. You know, he's already slew 1,000 by himself. And, uh, and so he, in verse 20, and she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep. I wonder what kind of sleep that was. How can you cut a man's hair? while he's asleep. Now, I've gone to sleep in a barber's chair, I guess, but my hair hadn't got seven locks. I got seven hairs. <laughs> and, and, you know, when they sometimes you get in that barber's chair, and, you know, and they, <laughs> next thing you know, you'll drift off. But I, but, I mean, to get that heavy hair of him cut, and he's asleep, I, I, I really believe he was drugged or drunk. Now, I don't know that. But somehow, you know, he had already had his hair sewed in a blanket, in a quilt. And then now he's letting them cut it. And then he wakes up after it's all said and done now. And, and he goes uh, in verse 20, and, Sam, and he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Well, when you live like the devil and you, you're not in close fellowship with the Lord, uh, you may not know where you're at in your life. Uh, I, sometimes, you know, I get, Christians get, you know, they serve the Lord for several years, maybe years, and you see them start drifting away a little bit and a little bit, you know, and they start, a lot of times they'll start like they, Wednesday night, they start missing on Wednesday, and then a, a year or two later, they start missing on Sunday night. <laughs> then another year, they start missing on Sunday. <laughs> and then they don't go to church anywhere. And uh, you, you wonder, where do they think they're at in their Christian life? Where do they think they're at in their, their fellowship? Uh, sometimes they think it doesn't matter. And inevitably, something happens to where they want a close communication with God and they find themselves in a position where they can't or they seem like they can't get in touch with heaven. So Samson, he's going about... Now, it didn't say that his strength was in his hair. His hair was a symbol that he had consecrated himself unto the Lord, which was the only thing left in his life that made him or showed him to be a Nazarite. He'd already broken vows. He'd gone to work in a vineyard. He'd, he'd touched 
dead carcasses and killed men. So there was nothing in that part of his life that made him seem as though he had consecrated himself to God. But his hair was the last thing that made him unique before other men, the world. He looked, in their view, like a guy dedicated to God and God only. Well, when he had his hair cut, everybody likes to say it was in his hair. Uh, but I really think it was the fact that that was it. He no longer was consecrated. That was the last thing left. And so it says that he, he wist not that the Lord had departed. He doesn't even, that's somebody said that's the, sev, that's the saddest sentence in the Bible. He wist not that the Lord was departing from him. But the Philistine took him, they had no mercy on him, put out his eyes. Now that had to be one painful event. I, I still can't fathom somebody being able to go through that and live. But they do. And uh, remember when they carried uh, it was, it was one of the kings, maybe it was, I don't think it was Jehoshaphat, but one of the kings they carried off to captivity and they made him watch his seven sons being killed. And after they were killed, they gouged his eyes out. The idea was that's the last thing you're going to see, your sons being murdered. And so in Samson, the last thing he saw was a treacherous woman who did him in who he shouldn't have been fooling with. And this was a pattern. Too bad. The Bible says that they bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. Now that Apparently, up until this point, and uh, historians say that they did not have uh, mills at that time with horses and mules hooked up to them. The mill was a stone that an individual ground corn and wheat in by hand. And remember the lady that threw the millstone off the roof to kill Ahab, I believe, or one of the wicked kings and threw it off the roof. It was generally considered a woman's work to grind at the millstone. So here you got this super he-man who is known in that part of the world as uh, a, a, a superhero. He was the strongest, fastest, most powerful man they'd ever seen. He had the ability to control whole countries and he's down now to a weak and he's lost his masculinity they put him doing a feminine job and he's grinding at a millstone now you would think that would be enough humiliation he's blind he's lost it all he doesn't even have a girlfriend anymore no girl wants him now He's a nobody. They used him up, kicked him out. Nothing to it. And a bunch, a bunch of folks have written songs about that stuff down through the ages. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Now, here's the life of Samson. Binding, blinding, grinding, and then bondage of sin. Binding, blinding, and grinding. <laughs> that could be a sermon, could it not? Are you bound? Are you ground? <laughs> oh. How be it, guess what? While he's in the prison house, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. So I don't think it's got time to grow as long as it was, but everybody knows you can shave a man's head off and give it a month or two or three or four, he'll start growing again. And at his age, probably fast. Um, then after all that the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice for they said our God 
hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. Now, this is a pretty serious situation here. What Samson's done, he's brought reproof upon the Lord God of Israel from a bunch of heathen. They really can't touch the Lord God. But on earth, they can pretend that somehow what they believe is superior to the book and to the God of the book. And they're now claiming this Dagon, who's been around actually in that area of the world since about 2500 B.C. They've actually got uh, tablets and inscriptions that mention Dagon all the way back to the days of the pharaohs in Egypt uh, even the Pharaoh who was uh, around when Moses was there, uh, in that time, uh, Dagon was one of the deities that the heathen worshipped. Now, there's been some talk about the Dagon being uh, the fish god. And, uh, I, I, you know, there's that, that used to be at one time uh, the great, uh, you know, way that you connected the hat of the Pope to Dagon the fish god. And, I don't know that that now, uh, based on what they have dug up, uh, can hold water. Uh, Dagon really was uh, known as the god of wheat. And uh, he, uh, if he, the Philistines kind of took on him as a deity after the Assyrians had him, the Egyptians had him. Uh, the Babylonians also were known to worship Dagon. And, uh, and everything they found, I think they found one thing that was later on that showed a body of a man, a torso of a man, and a fish tail. And all that got started from that. But uh, uh, it appears that uh, Dagon, and, and, and here's the thing, and, and I want you to think about this. Remember when the Philistines came later on in, in, in the first Samuel and they stole the Ark of the Covenant? They took it to Dagon's temple. And they were going, yeah, we got Israel's God. And uh, look, at, look how he, we're going to bring him uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant and make the Ark of the Covenant bow down to our God, Dagon. I'm going to tell you something. Heathen will do anything. If you think heathen somehow will one day in America go, oh, yeah, we were all wrong about those Christians. No, they're not. No, they're not. Listen, you could blind them with blindness and they wouldn't be wrong. They'd, they'd still keep on believing like they do. Hey, when they have reprobated minds, uh, they're in a bad shape. And these people out here today that you and I hope one day will see the light, some of these rulers and politicians who are so debauched and corrupt, I mean, so much corruption down to the core of their being, the lies and deceit, stealing money from different countries and selling out our country. I, uh, this afternoon, uh, they were talking about, you know, the Chinese are trying to buy uh, a farm in North Dakota right next to one of our Air Force bases. And, you know, because money's involved, there's a good possibility they're going to get it done. So they're going to build a big factory, and we know how they work. They'll bring their people right there, and they'll be, hey, they'll be flying those planes before they know it. And over us, our own bases. How do we get this? How do we get like this? I mean, we Christians look at it and we say, what's the matter? With them, if you really know who's running it, and how they're being manipulated by the devil himself, there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they are who they are. <laughs> they're just acting like this bunch here. They, they're out there saying, praise Dagon. He's better than the Lord God Jehovah. <laughs> and the creator of their world that they are now standing on, they're mocking. And uh, uh, tonight, uh, look with me in Isaiah chapter number, I believe, 44, because I want this is important to understand these Philistines. It, it's amazing how we, we tend to want to uh, figure out that 
uh, or come to the point where we, we look at when they say these gods, we go, well, that, that, they're all worshiping statues and we don't do that today. And Yes, we do. It's an idea. Uh, a God is first an idea. And uh, right now, you know what? Uh, education's a God in this country. They, it, it, science is a God. Uh, they'll say, uh, but the science says, and they'll put men's observations and interpretations above what the Word of God says. And they do it readily, do they not? Creationism, they reject what the book says, and they start telling you some fairy tale that is so beyond comprehension, they can't really explain it, so they make up these numbers to try to manipulate minds to thinking that somehow you won't think about 250 million years because you can't. You can't relate. And so they build their fairy tale within that. And then they look at you and say, something's wrong with you people for believing that God created the heaven and earth. So then they worship that. And uh, we've seen how they worship science in this COVID thing. Science false, false, falsely so-called. Uh, man, it's getting bizarre out there. All the stuff now rolling in from the very people who were promoting it now are finding and studying and say, wait a minute, well, we, we may have a problem here. You know, what is there? The problem, Houston? Well, uh, some of the very manufacturers I saw where Pfizer came out the other day in Israel and said, you know, we have to admit that it looks like it's causing heart inflammation in certain young people. Uh, yeah, that's what people have been saying from day one. Saw yesterday a little six-year-old girl who got her booster shot, went home, developed seizures, and they took her back in. She had more seizures, and she died at six years old. And her mother was on the, uh, social media bragging about taking her kids in and getting them booster shots. And she kept, and then her mother got one and she talked about how sick she got the second time around, how much fever she's had. And she was so much worse off than the first time. And I'm thinking, well, why did you bring your kids in there? They're kids. They got natural immunity. They can fight. And you remember how they used to say it was good for you to get sick as a kid? I mean, they'd say, you know, I'm sick. Well, that's good for you. <laughs> yeah, but mama, hush up, get in the bed. I'll bring you, if you're really good, I'll bring you some seven up. <laughs> that was the only thing you got. And castor oil. That cured everything. <laughs> so, you know, but now they don't want anybody getting sick. So they, they're going to fix God's body. I'm afraid of everything folks are coming. You know, I'm, I would trust the doctors in the 1930s more than, because <laughs> not that these doctors are bad, all of them. I'm just saying they're, they're living in a world of falsely so-called science, and everybody's out to make a buck first. Well, chapter 44, verse number 9, this fish god or this Dagon, wheat god, uh, God uh, tells them, about the idolatry, he said, they make a graven image or all of them vanity and their delectable things shall not profit and they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they, that they may be ashamed. He said, they're so foolish. They are worshiping things they make with their own hands and you can't explain it to them. That's how messed up their minds get. Who hath formed a God? or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing. Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. One day, God's saying, I'm going to fix you people where you're going to be able to see how foolish you were. And, of course, the New Testament says that one day every eye shall see him, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. You're going to get it one day, and it's going to be embarrassing at the least. And he says, The smith, in verse 12, with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashioneth with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and his faint. He dedicates himself 
to making false idols. Now, these are idols that are going to be bowed down to, that their religion and their philosophy is going to be built around, and their people in the community are all going to be zoned in on this false, this image that some guy down at the, uh, you know, at the mill was making with his own hands. He's getting paid hourly, and maybe if he's working for a good mill, he's got a health insurance plan. But other than that, that's all. And he's the one fashioning their gods. And God is mocking them for that. The carpenter stretches out the rule. He, mark, he maketh it out of a line. He fitteth it with planes and he marketh it out with a compass and he maketh it after a figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. Little figurines. He heweth down cedars with his hands now and taketh the cypress and the oak which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. They're actually harvesting their own trees that they grew for the purpose of making false images. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. So you see, this has become a, 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 a manufacturing time. They're actually planting crops for idols. You would think, somebody would step back and say, how can this be God if I'm making it? My old dirty hand got splinters in it and I know I've said some bad words while I'm making it and yet can you not look back and say that can't be God? You made it. But they couldn't. Verse 16, he burneth part thereof in the fire and he parteth thereof. He eateth flesh, he roasteth roast and satisfieth. Yea, he warmeth himself and he says, oh, I'm warm, I've seen the fire. So he takes the tree, he makes idols and he also uses it for cooking. Same tree. Somehow it's supposed to be holy. And it's supposed to be a deity. In verse 17, the residue thereof he maketh a god. <laughs> out of the firewood and out of the planted tree. Even his graven image, he falleth down unto it and worshipeth it. And prayeth unto it. And said, deliver me for thou art my God. If you get the pictures, it shows you God has nailed these people with their absolute insanity. They don't even, they can't even stop long enough to think that what they're doing. In verse 18, they have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in his heart. Neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I've burned part of it in the fire. Yea, I've also baked bread upon the coals thereof. I've roasted some steak and eaten it. And may I, and shall I make residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He said there's nobody even asked those questions. Now, I'm telling you, in this case, in the New Testament, the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of them, lest the light of the glorious gospel shine into them. I'm telling you, we live in a corrupt world of Philistine realities. And yet, you got Samsons out there all over the place that should be an asset to helping the people of God and many have chosen the way of the world, the money, the wealth, and in some cases, sadly to say, the women, and traded it all in. Traded it all in. Some of them, great orators, great spokesmen. Well, look at there in verse number 20. He feedeth on ashes. He actually eats that which he'd been worshiping. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? I mean, so these are the people that the Philistines had become. And they're saying, we've got Samson's God right where we want him. And they build, they go to the temple of Dagon, and they put the Ark of the Covenant, and later on they stole it in Samuel and put it down there. You know what happened to Dagon in the temple? They go in the next morning and Dagon had fallen off his post. 
boom. They go, whoa, what's going on here? So they go in the next, that day and they pick old Dagon up. and they, That's their God. I mean, they made him. Put it right there. They go in the next day, he falls off his post and he breaks himself. And so they go, hmm, we're superstitious. We got to get rid of this idol. We don't want to get rid of the idol. We got to get rid of this ark. It's, it's bad luck. <laughs> yeah, because you're taking a place where God dwells and you're equating it to your false God. And the, the, the Bible says that I am the Lord. There's none greater. There's none other. And all of these, hey, these are you, the, the Hindus. Look, you say, well, they're Hindu people, they're religious. No, no, they're deceived, debauched people who have rejected truth. That's who they are. The Buddhists, for them to take that guy you see in the Chinese restaurant with a big belly, and that's who they worship, they're not just people who have their own religion. They're deceived to the point they can't even admit they made that thing with their own hands. That's how bad they are. The Islamists, they created their Allah. And they, they're not just people going, uh, well, they're just, they're, there's a, a billion people or two billion people. So what? God has already said this is what these people do. They, they, they create and mess up and they, and they fail and they, and they know they're corrupted but they don't want to deal with it. So I'm telling you, uh, when, you get, when the God of this world blinds the eyes of them uh, or when the Lord turns them over to a reprobate mind, hey, just because uh, tonight they're bold against the Christians, and they hate the Christians. Uh, that doesn't mean anything other than they're losers. And they're going to lose bigger. And one day they're going to wake up, and, but it's going to be too late. They're going to find out all their foolishness was just that. Hearts of fools. Hindus were going through India this past week. And they, uh, there was a Christian church in one of the sections. Like they're in this area of Hindus. There's 1.7% so-called Christians. And uh, they came in and they beat up the preacher and beat the people. And they told them, if you don't deny Christianity, it's going to be worse next time. And so they go in and they burn all the buildings down. And you know what? The government who's in that province, Hindu, that's okay. And, and you say, how can that happen? Well, the liberals in this country have their own thugs out there now. They operate outside the law, and the law won't hold them accountable. And they can go to these pro-life centers and burn them down. And nobody goes to jail. But that dad that was standing on a street corner up in uh, Philadelphia who's got five, three or four kids standing out there with him holding a sign, been doing it for 20 years, they took the Justice Department, came against him, and took him and was going to send him to prison for 11 years but a jury of his peers acquitted him yesterday. After our Department of Justice, they don't go down there and get the killers that are running up down the street killing everybody and, and body spraying folks. That, that, I ain't got time for that. We got this guy that, that's, that's protesting against abortion. He's the threat. I tell you, boy, it gets crazy. It's getting crazier, you know, and... Uh, Saw where this in in uh, uh, Sweden or was it? I believe where um, this guy who had raped two women was getting ready to be sentenced to prison, and so he decides he's a transgender woman now. So show you how crazy they get. Now he's already been convicted of raping two women violently. They said, well, if he says he's a transgender woman. Then he's a transgender woman, and they put him in a women's prison. You can't even make this up that there's no sanity there. Now, he was he he's 40 years old and he never was saying he was a woman before. Suddenly, when he gets sentenced, he's a woman. And the government says, well, if that's what he says, then 
we believe him to be. I mean, it doesn't stop. There's, hey, I'm telling you, it's going to get worse. We say, how much more bizarre can it get? Hey, it can get even worse. We, I don't think we're halfway there. And so we need to pray for the country that God would intervene. And he could. Pray that it be his will that he turn the clock back and give us a few more years to preach the gospel and, and a few more years to get the word of God around the world because uh, uh, it's, heading, it's heading fast to hell. Appreciate you being out tonight and I uh, hope you'll come back on Sunday morning. Lord, we pray that you'd bless us as we go. Help us to be a light to shine in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. We know, Lord, that you are the light of the world. May we show forth that light in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.